Good evening. Hello and welcome. This is, of course, your live webinar that has been organised as part of the Business Management Virtual Work Experience, which is powered by SpringPod. I know so many of you have already joined us here on these calls. So if that is yourself, welcome back. We're excited to see you again. And of course, if you are new around here, welcome and we really do hope that we are giving you as much information as you absolutely need but if you do need any help at all please don't hesitate we do have a little green chat icon at the bottom right hand corner of the platform there's no such thing as a stupid question and our team are there to help so please use it if you absolutely need to now we do have some newbies. I will give you a quick little rundown of the session so this talk is going to last between 30 to 40 minutes so that gives you a good idea in terms of your timings and things like that uh, and like I say, we do actually have a Q&A function on this platform. Some of you might have used it before. If so, great. If you are new, get all the questions in there. We are here to give you as much as we possibly can in a short space of time. So let us know what you want to hear. However, if you do see a question in there that maybe you were going to ask, or now that you see, you quite like the look of, instead of writing the question again, all you've got to do is vote for the question. So if you vote for the question, bring it to the top of my list. It just means if we are a little bit short on time, the chances of me getting to it are just that little bit higher. Now, we totally understand that life happens. You might have to pop off halfway. Do not panic. We are not easily offended. And lucky for you, you don't have to miss a thing. It's all recorded and we aim to get it to you within the next 24 hours. And it's also really handy as well if you want to have a little watch back, maybe take some notes if you miss anything. Now, what are we chatting about today? Well, today's webinar is all about operations and communications. And joining us is Jonathan Bond, who's the Director of HR and Learning at Pinsent Nations. Hello there, Jonathan. Hi, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I believe you have a very slick presentation. So I'll hand over to you and then we'll do the Q&A at the end. Very good. Thanks, Robin. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the world of HR, which is a world that I've been based in for, for many years. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun. And, and I hope those of you who go into uh, working in HR will do too. So Alex, if we could have the next slide, please. What I want to cover, I'll tell you a little bit about my career to date and the type of things I've done during a mainly an HR career. I'll then talk to you about what people in HR do from the point of view of an employee. So I'll take you through what we call the employee life cycle. I'll explain more about what I mean about that later. Um, I'll talk to you about what I do each day. How do I fill my time? Uh, what the type of work I do? And then, like Robin said, I'll answer your questions at the end. So going to the next slide, um, just explaining a little bit about my career. I, uh, I left university a long time ago. I left Sheffield University in 1987, and I got a job with um, NatWest Bank as a, a so-called super grad on the, the graduate training scheme, which was a great education in the world of business. So even though I was interested in HR at the time, um, I thought I'd broaden my know-how. I, I, I worked at a bank, um, and that really taught me about or how different businesses work, how banks lend money to them, why they lend money, why some businesses succeed, why some fail, um, and it was a good education. Um, Banking, really mainstream banking wasn't for me, good education though it was. So I went into various roles in strategy and, co and communications. I worked um, in internal comms for, for the bank. I worked as a, a speech writer, believe it or not, um, for the chairman of the bank for a short period. And then I ran the graduate recruitment um, operation for NatWest Bank um, for a few years, um, going out to universities and, and recruiting 150 or so graduates per year for, for the bank and then helping them with their development. I was then headhunted for a law firm called Alan Overy, a so-called Magic Circle law firm. I did a similar role for them, uh, running their graduate recruitment program. Then I managed their internal communications function. Then they appointed me as head of career development, which was really head of learning and development for the organization. Um, then I went into a, a, more, um, a more mainstream HR role as head of HR for the global corporate division. And then I was lucky enough to be headhunted again, this time by my present employers 15 years ago. And Pinson Masons is a global law firm. Um, I joined it. I'm still in the same role. I've actually been doing the same job for 15 years, believe it or not. But the job was very different. When I joined, there were 30 people in my team and there were 1,500 people in the organization. Now there's um, over 130 in my team that I'm responsible for. And there's um, now 3,600 people in the firm across 27 offices in, in six, 17 countries. So it's a, it's a big and uh, international role. So hopefully you, you can see there how, how my career has evolved every career is different um, but that's just one example of how a career might go and I think the key point is where, where you end up 
when you're my age, which is 55, work won't be the same place you started. So it can be a long, and, and some people work for a lot more employers than I do. I mean, I'm probably unusual. I've only worked in three, three different places, but I've had lots of different roles within each of those places. So going on to the next slide and talking through a little bit more about, um, just to illustrate that point about, about my, my present employers, Pinson Masons, we're headquartered in London. We've got offices dotted around the UK, Ireland, and then we've got ones in Europe and then ones as far far afield as, as Australia. Um, now, um, some people look at this and think it sounds all very glamorous. And, and, and the truth is I've had some very interesting trips. I've spent time in, particularly in, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, places like that, um, which is nice in the English winter to get to these sort of warmer climates and, and see different places. But just a touch of reality is that when you go to these places, mo mostly you're there working, you're in the office, perhaps you go out in the evening, but again, it's with colleagues and you're talking about work things. So you, you're you're seeing a little bit of the world, but you're seeing the kind of the corporate part of the world r rather than, you know, really, really looking around a place. So um, beware a job that offers you travel because it will probably impinge on your own time. And quite a bit of that time will be spent at airports, on airplanes and in offices rather than sort of wandering around the place. So just a slight, slight note of caution about a global role, interesting though it is. Okay, going on to the next slide, and uh, then uh, I said earlier I wanted to take you through the employee lifestyle. What I'm going to do over the next five minutes is talk you through each of the what, what an HR person does in each of these things. So if you just think about any person who joins an organization, they need to be recruited in the first place. They then need to be what I call onboarded, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, HR functions are responsible for developing people, responsible for managing their performance and ensuring that's as good as possible, for rewarding them and recognizing their efforts. And then and then sometimes at the end of that cycle, um, people leave, they either retire, sometimes they're fired, so sometimes they, they choose to leave the organization. And we'll talk about that too. So I'll just take you around that wheel, starting with the recruit police, if we could have the next slide, please. So, um, Pinson Masons is, is, is a big and successful em employer, but we still have to work really hard to attract talented people. And McKinsey had this phrase they, they introduced a few years ago called the war for talent. And the truth is the best people, the people with really good academic qualifications and really good skills, um, a lot of employers want the same people to come and work for them. So we have to stand out for the crowd. So my job is to try and think about, well, what's how can we put our best foot forward? How can we make my employer, Pinson Masons, be attractive? How can we make the best people want to go there and, and yes it partly it's about the salary but it's about so much more than that it's about um, what what you can offer the culture what it's like to the work there how people behave your values your vision and it's even things like um, how you approach issues like climate change which is so important to many young people entering the workplace now so you, you, you can't be agnostic about that you can't be silent about it you've got to have a thoughtful approach to things like that we, we recruit graduates, we recruit school leavers, and we recruit qualified people, and we have different channels to do that. And as I've mentioned on the slide, having an inclusive environment where um, you're recruiting diverse people, where people can be themselves. Um, I've always thought personally that's important, but that's become even more important in recent years um, as people entering the workplace are looking for that. So, okay, once we've recruited them, if we go on to the next slide, we go on to on onboarding them. And well, what is that? Uh, well, it's it's activities that make someone feel at home in an organization and make them feel welcome and make them perform at their best. And there's a thing called um, discretionary effort. And I think you, you'll probably recognize if you think about it, that when you, when you go to school, when you go to university, yes, of course, you try every day. But there's that little bit of, of super trying you might do if you feel really inspired to do it or really motivated or you've got a, a goal in, in sight or the exam's about to happen. There's that little bit of extra effort. And it's the same when you work in an organization. People have discretionary effort, that bit. They can still do the job okay, but if they feel inspired and motivated, if they feel at home in an organization, they can do even better. And so the job of the HR function is to think, well, how can we um, get discretionary effort from people? How can we make them feel motivated and inspired? And, and in particular about making people feel comfortable, like they belong to an organization. So that, that's what onboarding is all about, helping people settle in, having good in induction routines, helping them integrate, making sure they've got the tools to do their job 
And as I've said on the slide, sadly, a lot of people leave within a short period. And it's so expensive to, to, to hire people in terms of the time, um, sometimes the recruitment agent fees. It's really important to make them feel settled quickly and to help people settle in. So, so that's onboarding for you. That's part of HR. Then moving to the next slide, the develop piece. Um, so it's super important in almost any organization that you help people develop their performance and improve themselves and learn new skills. Um, because let's face it, mo most people um, don't want to just stand still. They don't want to do the same job year after year. They want to have a sense of development. A bit like, you know, if, if, if it'd be like doing... Um, that doing the same job and not developing would be like doing the first year at school over and over and over again. It'd be boring. It's just not what you want to do. You, we, we all want to develop and go on to bigger and better things. So um, it's important that the HR function, particularly the learning and development function, help people do that. And as you can see on this model, um, really 70% of the learning you'll do will be from the job that you do, from the work you do. And I'm a great believer in, in actually people learn from mistakes. And so I don't think mistakes should be treated like client crimes. I think mistakes should be treated like learning opportunities, which is what they are. So people will learn so much, but they'll only learn if they're well managed and they have a manager who helps them reflect on what they did well, what they could do better. And a manager who gives them feedback and who says, okay, um, let, let me help you learn from that. And, and let me, let me um, give you my perspective from more experience point of view on, on what you did well and what you could do better. So giving people praise for a job well done, but also helping them understand how they can be better. So the HR function creates a framework for those conversations and has different systems that, that we have in place to help line managers do that. But as well as the on-the-job experience, there's, um, there's uh, training courses that we run um, uh, and we make sure that people have the opportunity to learn from colleagues in, in other parts of the organization, sometimes from external speakers. And now in this more virtual world we're in, um, through, through online, online uh, training of different types. So that's a little bit about the develop piece. Moving on to the next uh, part of the cycle, um, performance management. Now, every, everyone comes to work and wants to do a good job. Um, and um, this is where, in a way, the talent management piece comes in. W one of my jobs is to think about who are our leaders of the future, who are our future people who might be the managing partner of the firm um, the re or the board members of the, of the future, and to make sure that we've recognized those people, that they're on the fast track, and they were planning, for doing some succession planning for the future senior people in the organization. But the other part of the job is sometimes also um, dealing with underperformance, with people who, frankly, aren't very good at doing their job. And, and and mostly there's a reason for that. It's sometimes because somebody hasn't been trained properly. It might be because they're not supervised properly. It's perhaps because they've not been given the right instructions. Perhaps it's because they haven't got the right the right um, IT at their disposal. Sometimes it's because it, there's been issues in the per per personal life that's got in the way. There's been a bereavement. There's been some sort of personal difficulty they're going through, like at the end of a relationship. Occasionally, sadly, um, the, um, people simply aren't up to the job long term. And um, my children, I've got three teenage sons, and, and obviously they know that I'm an HR director, and they, they think my job is all about going around firing people. They think that I'm like um, Lord, uh, Lord Sugar in The Apprentice. Now, of course, I'm, I'm not like that, but occasionally I do. I am involved in dismissing people, and it's a, a much more respectful process than you see on a program like that um, because you have laws um, governing people's rights rights to work, you can't just go around firing people, you've got to have a, a reason, otherwise it would be an unfair dismissal and they can make a claim in a, an employment tribunal. So it's done in a very respectful way, but sometimes it is necessary um, to, to, to do that. Um, but if you do it right, actually, um, I've, I've had people who I'm still in touch with who I've dismissed them, but they, they, they're grateful to me because of the way it was done and they stay in touch with me long term. So I'm pointing that out really because it, it's, it's not quite as it seems. Um, so firing is part of, of HR, but it's generally done in a very respectful way, not like the, the drama you would see on TV. Um, and um, But it does mean that if you work in HR, then to a certain extent, you need to have that um, resilient personality. You need to be a strong personality. And as you get upset too easily, then, you know, that, then that part of HR won't be for you. Um, OK, let's move on to the reward and recognize um, side of things. Um, so. Um, Actually, yes, I talked about that. So you reward and recognize. Um, so it's very important that um, people in organizations, one of the ways of motivating them is making sure that they're recognized for their efforts. And there's different ways of doing that. Clearly, clearly 
the salary um, is part of that. Um, and we, we have an annual salary review process where people's salaries are generally increased once per year. We also have a bonus process where people receive a bonus for doing extra work, for doing something that's extraordinary. Um, one of the jobs I did recently was to design a new bonus for the organization. So that's a very interesting piece of work where you think, okay, what are the things we should be rewarding and how can I design a bonus scheme to try and recognize those? But as well as people being rewarded through salary and bonus, um, there's other ways you can recognize people. So it might be by allowing them to work in an agile way. It might be by giving them a new job or giving them a chance to develop in, in the present job. It might be by looking after their well-being. So, for example, we have a range of benefits that we invest in, such as pr private health care, such as annual checkups, such as benefits around sort of dental, uh, doctor uh, care, etc. So um, that's something that's increasingly important to people. And then there's the, the the inclusion piece that I mentioned earlier. So people will feel more rewarded and more valued um, if, if we enable them to be themselves and if we make sure um, that we have the, the, the right um, communication and the right ethos when it comes to diversity. Okay, so I think I've talked through that the, the, the circle. Hopefully that gives you a sort of really, uh, really good insight. And then just the, the, the final thing, I mentioned this um, this the seller review piece. I wanted just to make one more point about this, which is that um, the HR job um, is a kind of, it also involves some numerical skill because each year we have to think about what we can afford to pay and how we're going to divide that pot. And we, we come up with some systems and some rules and processes using percentages and, and then calculating the individual salary increases for each person. So again, people might think that that, that you don't need to be numerate to, to work in HR, but I think it does help because you do this sort of work and, and having been generally comfortable with, with figures and able to use a spreadsheet for example, it is quite helpful when you're doing that type of work. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, um, um, I, I, I wanted also to mention that as well as the, the, the bonus thing, um, we invented a so-called spot bonus scheme. So uh, as well as having an annual bonus, we've got this thing that allows a manager to recognize good work whenever it's done. Um, and um, it's quite interesting what, you know, what motivates people. Um, people really get motivated if their manager spots them doing something good and if they know that the manager's seen it and if there's some tangible example of it so that's why we provided this fund for managers to do this rather than just waiting for a once a year system okay on to the next slide please um so just recapping then that's that's the life, life cycle and that's what hr people do we recruit people we help them settle into the organization. We make sure that they develop their performance through learning and development. Um, we, we help manage the, the performance, ensure that's on track, I deal with if it goes off track, um, sometimes involved in managing people out, out of the organization. And then we make sure there's a system for rewarding and recognized people through, through annual salary reviews, through bonuses, both annual ones and, and spot bonuses. So I hope that gives you a little insight um, in, into the all the different things that HR people do at different stages of that of that cycle. Okay, so a few a few more things, probably two, two more things to cover before we take questions. Um, I just thought I'd give you an insight into what I spend my time doing each day. And um, pre pre pandemic, this was all done well. 80% of it was done in an office during the pandemic. I had an 18 month period where I, I worked only at home, mainly in this room. And then more recently, I've been going to the office one to two days per week and, and, and working at home the rest of the time. Um, so what am I concerned with? Well, of course, now at my stage of the career, I'm running a big department. There's 135 people in the department that I run. Um, so I'm delegating a lot of the day-to-day -day work that I've talked about to those people. And, and the things that an HR director does um, I, I'm really interested in the strategy uh, uh, of what we're doing around people. So I'm interested in what are the new things we can do on well-being, um, but particularly given the strain the pandemic has had on people's mental health and the well-being. I'm thinking, how can we support them better than we're doing? How can we drive diversity to a new level? And what are the aspects of diversity we need to, to work on to improve as an organization? Um, so we, we've made great strides on, on LGBT diversity. Um, we need to make better strides on ethnic diversity, and that, that's current focus right now we've set ourselves targets of where we're going to improve uh, reward i mentioned so yes my job was designed so this new bonus policy um, is literally going to pay millions and millions of pounds next year to people so it's quite a responsibility to be in charge of designing some sort of policy that pays all that money and uh, the the organization is is uh, backing me um, to have made the right decisions to be rewarding the right things and then driving change so 
I mean, a great example of that change is that, you know, we've had this extraordinary period um, of more people than ever before in, in certainly in my lifetime working remotely. And we've got this big question about how does, what does the future of work look like? Is it, is it remote? Is it an office? Is it a combination of the two? And, and, and if it is a combination of the two, how, how will young people learn, given that they used to learn by sitting next to people and asking questions by so-called by, by osmosis? So one of my real areas of interest is thinking about new ways of learning for the future generations entering the workplace. So it's a big question. And I, I really love turning my mind to those big questions and thinking what can work well for my organization. So that's uh, other things. Well, I, I have to manage people. I have I have 135 people reporting to me in my team. Um, and I'm obviously I don't manage all of them. I manage probably the top 10 of them who in turn manage others. So the more difficult questions come to me. And, and out there in the business, um, managers who have really, really super difficult questions about employees come to me for advice from time to time. And the board, the board of Pitts and Masons come to me um, to ask for advice. So a year ago when the pandemic struck in March last year, the board of Pitts and Masons came to me and said, um, we want you to save us six million pounds um, because we haven't got enough uh, revenue coming in from our clients. Can you please put to the board in, in sort of two weeks time an idea for how we can save six million pounds so that's quite a lot of pressure again i quite like that pressure i like that challenge um when you've got a lot of experience like i have you back yourself to come up with some ideas and sure enough we did actually save that money through it through a scheme i came up with and so it, it, it's very very challenging it's not for the faint-hearted but it's really really interesting and it's very satisfying where it goes right okay so finally um final slide please um what skills do you need if you want to work in HR and if you want to get to the top of that career and be an HR director? Now, it's commonly thought that, you know, if to work in HR, you've got, you've got to like people and you've got to be a nice person. Well, yes, of course, you, you've, you've got to be able to get on with people. But I would say um, that you can't be a pushover. And so um, that my opinion is that you do need sensitivity, but you also need steel. So you need to have a combination of those two people. So in other words, someone who can really get on well with people and can empathize and can show compassion and can listen to people and can understand them. But also you can't be saying yes all the time. People are constantly asking me things. And, I, and unfortunately I can't say yes. Quite often I have to say no. And I say it nicely, but, but you can't be a pushover. So um, again, you need that kind of resilience and robustness if you want to get to the top in the career of HR. And then I put that those kind of skills there, ability to handle people, ability to communicate both orally and in writing. A little, a little bit, I don't, you don't have to be a kind of maths graduate, but you need to be comfortable with figures and have, have a, an idea for the shape of figures. And you need to be interested in the business you're in. So I'm working in a law firm. I've got to be interested in what lawyers do. I can't just say, no, no, I'm, I'm, that's of no interest. I'm in HR. You've got to be interested in it. You've got to kind of follow the trends with what, what lawyers do and, and why they do it, how they do it. And a bit of creativity really helps because, because you're coming up with, with, with problems that have more than one answer. So you need to really kind of think, be able to think outside the box um, and, and think of different answers. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so really uh, just um, happy now to hand back to Robin and uh, more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has, Robin. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. I think what was really, really clear to me was, my goodness, there's so much in HR that you just wouldn't necessarily think falls on HR. Um, a lot of business decisions as well. Now, I've got um, a little question here coming for you. Um, now, of course, you're working in a law environment. And I know you mentioned just there in your last slide um, that you kind of have to have a business interest. But is it important to have an understanding of the sector that you would be working in the HR department of? Yeah. So, I mean, in, in my case, you know, I, I don't need to be a qualified lawyer. I don't need a law degree. Yeah. Um, but I need to understand what, what lawyers do. Mm -hmm. And so... One thing that really interests me about lawyers, for example, is that um, they tend to be risk averse because they're managing clients on how to deal with risks. They tend to worry a lot about the future because, again, that's part of the job. It's partly what, what drew, drew them to it. Yeah. They're very pedantic because they're using language the whole time in contracts. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really crisp and clear with your language. Um, and also, remarkably, um, law students are four times as likely as medical students to suffer from stress or anxiety. So that tells you something about the psychological makeup of lawyers. And knowing all those things really helps me deal effectively with lawyers. So if I don't follow those trends, if I'm not interested in that, then, you know, that 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 
makes it less um, less likely I can be effective. Yeah, and a lot trickier, I would have thought as well. Um, I know you just touched on actually there, the psychology, which was going to be my next question. Um, we looked at the different skills that you thought would be beneficial, you know, maybe math skills, you know, dealing with those big bonuses and things like that. Um, do you think psychology and kind of understanding human behaviour is important? Uh, yes, I, I do think it's really helpful. Um, and so I know some psychology graduates who've gone into um, HR roles and done really well. In fact, my niece is hoping to do um, psychology at university ne next year. And so I said, hey, yeah, that could be a really valuable preparation. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it, do it does mean you can have that sort of understanding. And, and again, there's lots of lots of people who in, in HR who've never studied any psychology at all. Mm -hmm. um, the little insight I got into it was when I qualified as a, um, a psychometric assessor. So there's a thing called the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which okay. is the most widely used psychometric test in the world. And I, I took a qualification in that. Oh. And, and it, it's a fascinating insight into the different approaches people take to how, how they run their lives. It kind of opened my eyes a little bit to the differences in human behavior. So anyth anything like that that gives, yeah. you, that gives you an insight is very helpful. Not obligatory, but does give you an insight. Yeah. And in terms of the actual degrees that you think um, would would be kind of beneficial, maybe not so um, obvious ones, like maybe business management and things like that. But is there any others that you think, oh, those, those might be quite helpful to, to stand you in good stead? Yeah, I think you can you can go into HR with almost any degree. Um, so so my degree was in English. Um, and that has helped me on the communication side and particularly written communications. Mm -hmm. um, you might you might say studying English literature um, helps you a little bit with empathy because you're understanding something from multiple character insights. But I'm probably stretching the point a little, a little bit there. <laughs> so, so, certainly things like, yes, um, psychology is helpful. Probably any arts degree, history, all, all those things are helpful. We've mentioned psychology. Um, I mean, you could do you could do maths and go into HR. You know, that, that would help you on the kind of and I do have some very kind of techie people in my team who do yeah. data analysis who are HR analysts who who uh, study trends and come up with so some of them are people who've done very very numerous subjects so I, I think as, I, as I've said earlier there's quite a range of activity that goes on in HR yeah. and, and, and a different types of degree might lead you to different parts of those activities so th there's almost um, no limitation to the degree you could do you, almost any of them could be useful. Yeah I couldn't agree more and, I, and like you said one that shocked me, which I'm sure will shock a lot, um, uh, not shock, but uh, intrigue, should I say, <laughs> those watching, is is the maths that that would come in handy and that you were, you know, kind of put um, put to you to make a decision to save all this money. That's, you know, that's a lot of, it's a lot of maths needed in that one for sure. Um, I've had some more questions come in. Um, I know we touched a little bit there on degrees. Um, do you think that university or apprenticeship, you know, which one is better for working in a HR department? Yeah. Um... I wouldn't say one's better than the other. I'd say, I'd say the difference. So with an apprenticeship, if you're doing an HR apprenticeship, you probably learn more about the nuts and bolts. So if you're the sort of person who really likes to understand the details and, and how some of the basic things are done, then apprenticeship is, is super helpful for that. Um, in, in my case, I had both an advantage and a disadvantage. So I, I did a degree, I worked in different businesses, and I came into HR I came in really as an HR manager, having never done any of the junior jobs. And so the massive gaps in my understanding. And so the lot of stuff that people in HR shared services team, I just didn't didn't know what they, they did. And if they asked me to do their jobs, I would really struggle. So it, it gave me a fast track to a more senior role, but it did mean sometimes it was a, a, had the potential of being embarrassed because there were some details I just didn't know. So if you're the sort of person who really wants to go step by step mm -hmm. and, and, and do a more junior job before you step up to a more senior one, apprenticeship is great. If you're more interested in the fast track and you don't mind so much about having maybe little gaps in your knowledge, that then, but I'm conscious is of the drivers as well. And of course, you know, the, the, the vast cost of going to university is something mm. that you have to take into account. And whether you want the, you know, the lifestyle experience of living three years away from home, which is, you know, a great advantage to some, but not so attractive to others. So there's a lot that comes into that decision, I think, really. Yeah, I can agree more. And like you say, the, the finances is, is a big one, isn't it? I've had a really interesting question come in. Um, what are your top non-cliche tips for effective interpersonal communications in a negotiation situation? Okay. Uh, I would suggest two things there. Yeah. Um, firstly, um, don't be afraid to ask for something big. 
and I think sometimes people can be very um, English or should we say British about it uh -huh. um, and very polite and so they don't uh, and and so if you can be a bit bolder and you can go into something big it's surprising how people uh, there's um there's a, a a word for it uh, actually I can't even remember the word but <laughs> but it, it's almost like if my son says to me um oh can, can I have a can I have a car for my 18th birthday yeah. you know ten thousand pounds I say no you can't but I'll buy you this thing that's a thousand pounds yeah and because it seems small in comparison whereas I never actually intended spending a thousand pounds at all in the first place yeah. because he went in yeah. big he's so the compensation effect almost so yeah. say firstly don't be afraid to ask for something big and ask for it in a bold manner don't be looking at your shoes uh, and muttering and mumbling look the person in the eye and say this is what I'd like. This is my best case. So that would be my tip number one. Tip number two would be to really, really listen carefully um, to what the other person's saying and what they're not saying. And don't just listen to the words they're using. Look at their body language. Look about the way they say it. Look about are they looking at you? Or are they looking at someone else? Um, and it's so important. And people in, in, in my business, maybe in many businesses, aren't great listeners. They're very, they're great in broadcast mode. They don't really listen carefully and notice what people are saying. So when they're looking, for example, at someone's well-being, mm -hmm. sometimes they don't really listen to what's being said. And I, I'm not surprised because it takes energy. It's not easy to do. So they will be my two tips. Go big, be bold, but listen carefully to the other side. They're amazing tips and great question as well. Really interesting question. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, I know that we touched a little bit on kind of the changes that have happened in the last year and a half, year and a half, and kind of how HR has had a, a role in that. How would you say the different practices that are coming into work now? Are, are you having to address more like kind of mental health and and touch more on kind of personal issues than you did in the past? Yes. So there's been a very interesting change, um, and it's it's not just the pandemic. I think it's a generational change that's going on as well. So ten years ago, trainee lawyers in in a firm like mine. If they had a mental health issue, generally speaking, they wouldn't mention it because they would think it's a sign of weakness and a sign of failure that they're not good enough for the job to mention it, um, which is a pity because the problem would then tend to get worse. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really positive thing that um, that we're, we're saying to people, we have a mental health strategy. We have role models, senior people who are being open about the struggles they've had at times in their careers. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've normalized, we've legitimized the conversation about mental health. But I think at the same time, there's much better support at universities and school than there has been. I mean, I'm sure it could be improved, but it's better than it's been before. So people are being encouraged to be open about it. And so I'm finding young lawyers who work in our organization, if they have a mental health issue, they're more likely to be open about it and to say they need support. And I think that's a really good thing because once people are open, you know, you can do a proper assessment and give them the support. And I do think that has been exacerbated by a pandemic because it is an event that will cause anxiety, unfortunately, uh, across the piece. And it is an event that means that responsible employers really need to help not just young people everyone really who's suffering so that that's a change but i think it's mostly a positive change so we can be open about it and, and it becomes a problem that's sort of above above the iceberg rather than below couldn't agree more thank you for that jonathan i'm very aware that we've only got a few minutes left so i'd like to ask you one last question and that is what's the one piece of advice that you would have given your younger self um a bomb piece of advice I give my younger self. Um, I think um, be be confident, be confident about the future, um, and it'll it will work out fine. And enjoy the ride as well as you know trying your best and being focused. Um, have fun at the same time. And there's so many opportunities. There's so many things that are interesting. And if one thing doesn't quite go to plan or work out. It's not a problem. It's not a disaster. Um, and so chill out, work hard, but really enjoy it. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you fail, it's not the end of the world. Something else will be a, a really good avenue to explore. They would be the kind of things that would be in my mind. Perfect. Honestly, fantastic way to end a really insightful webinar. So thank you so much for your time today, Jonathan. It was really great, honestly. Welcome. Thank you. And for you guys watching, sadly, that is a wrap on this session. I know we could just chat 
forever with Jonathan. It was really been great. So thank you so much for your questions and for such interesting questions as well. So keep them coming as you carry on through your course. Now, of course, you got to get all your work um, submitted by the 12th of November to be eligible for that certificate. So please don't forget if you ever forget any of the important dates at all, get on over to module one. It's all in there and that'll help you out. So good luck and I'll see you soon.